his purpose. One of the problems in the house of God is that we are trying to seek our own purpose. And we're not saying, Lord, what is your purpose for me? Every morning I'm praying, I say, Lord, I don't know what you want me to do. Tell me what you need me to do today. I want to walk according to your purpose. Yes, I got plans when I get to the office. Yes, I have plans when I come back home. But Lord, let me walk according to your purpose. I'm going to preach this thing. Because sometimes we're in ministry. And sometimes we're doing things in the house of the Lord. And we have our own agenda. We have what we want to get done. And God said, it's not according to my purpose. And I'm not obligated to bless things that I did not speak. It may be quiet, but it's right. Matthew 4 and 4 says, but he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. His promises are so reliable that we live by them. I live by them. That's why even when I'm distraught in my mind and even when I'm desperate in my mind and, and things are going crazy, what keeps me to su surviving is the fact that I have a promise. I preach that thing. I have a promise. I may not have what I want to have right now. I may not see the results of the promise, but what keeps me coming out, what keeps me praising, what keeps me pressing for God, what keeps me serving God is that I may not have it right now, but baby, I got a promise. And if I have a promise, it's just like I already have it because the promises of God are yea and amen. We don't think we are sustained by God's promise. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things that are not yet seen. So I got faith that whatever he said, that he's going to do it. And that's why I keep serving. That's why I keep going. That's why I keep believing. It's because I got a promise. We don't live by our circumstances. We live by his word. We are kept by his promises. Whatever he said in his word about me, I can stand on that. I can live by that. I am kept by that until I get what he said he's going to do. I am kept by the promises alone. But the problem is, and this is where sometimes we got to make sure that we do our part. We must keep our promises to God. Now here's where it's going to get quiet, but it's okay. A lot of times we want to put the onus upon God and say, God, I need you to do this and do that and do this. But God says, I have covenant, and covenant is an if then. If you do this, then I will do that. Amen. I have a covenant with the person who with the bank who owns my truck. If I keep paying, they're not gonna come pick it up. If you stop paying, we're coming to get it. As long as I'm paying, I'm good. That's why people, sometimes we say we own a house. And I said it was kind of weird because I don't really own my house. The bank still owns my house. But the bank has a covenant that they cannot break. If I pay my note, if I fulfill my financial obligation, they cannot come in and take my house. So therefore, that's why we say we're still homeowners. Even though I don't have the title yet, I have a covenant that says if I keep my side of the bargain, y'all better hear me, I get to reap the benefits. This is what God says. I need you to keep your side of the bargain. The Bible says that you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of the land. Hear me when I say this. God does not want us in agreement with those that are not in agreement with him. God does not want us in agreement with those that are not in agreement with him. We have to be careful about our connections. We have to be careful about the people that we choose to connect to. We can disqualify ourselves from covenant because of our connections. God says, I'm trying to bless you. I'm trying to do things for you. But we got too many people attached to us. And my son preached this morning. Y'all believe that? My son preached this morning about leeches. I didn't know he was going through that. I had no idea. But he preached about leeches. And God says, you know, I want to bless you. But every time I bless you, they are sucking blessings from you. They're pulling blessings from you. And because you want to keep people attached to you, and the reason why you're disqualified is because of your connections. Yeah. Thank you, Brother Caleb. I appreciate that this morning. I appreciate that. That was a good assist right there because we have leeches sometimes that attach. And God says, the reason why I don't want to bless you is because whatever I give you will be given to them. Because you connected yourself to them. 
Now you connected yourself to them and say, well, no, 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 I, I, I can be this and not and not have uh, uh, any blessings blocked. No, 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 no. We got to understand that God says your connections are very serious and they can disqualify you from covenant. You don't believe it? Let's go. In 2 Corinthians 6 and 17, it says, therefore go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you. This is not saying you cannot speak to unbelievers. Don't, 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 don't go so far with this. It's not saying that you can't talk to nobody because, you know, one thing we don't want to be is a bunch of Sadidi saints. A bunch of self-righteous saints who never speak to nobody. Y'all better hear me. Who never talk to somebody. I don't care how sad you think you are. If you're going to go to the cookout and be uh, stuck up in the corner somewhere talking about you two saints. Who wants to go to your church? Your pastor told y'all y'all can't talk to nobody. Oh, that's, that's a cult. That's a cult. We should be equipping people that when they go out among people who may be unbelievers, when they go out, that their conversation is the right conversation. You got to be hospitable. You got to speak to people. You got to say good morning. In my job, I come in a little later than the rest of my staff, but I leave, you know, after the rest of my staff. And so I make sure every morning I speak to everybody in that building and say good morning to them. And if you mess up and you don't say it loud enough, I will go to your office. I said good morning. How you doing this morning? You know, you know, and the, the, the sister Tabitha said, if you are not having a good day, don't you mess, don't dare mess up somebody else's day, right? So like, if you came in with an attitude, that's fine. That's your attitude. Don't put it on me now. And, 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 and it should never be saints that do that. It should never be so-called Christians. You don't know what I'm going through this morning. That's okay. I just said good morning. I'm trying to speak over your morning. We don't even hear what people are saying. They're telling you to have a good morning. You may have had a bad morning that morning before you came to work. They're trying to speak life over your morning. And you dare not even accept that. And at least you can do is say good morning back to you. Y'all better catch a word when y'all get it. Y'all wait to listen to the radio, wait to listen to a, a sermon on YouTube, and if I can hear that sermon, I can be okay for the day. No, somebody spoke life to you. Somebody said, I don't care what kind of night you had. I don't care what happened this morning when we got to work. I'm speaking over your life right now. I came in to tell you, good morning. Y'all better hear me. So we got to talk to people to win them to Christ. However, speaking to them and being in covenant relationships with them, are two very different things. It's a different thing, isn't it? You see, if you are linked up with the world, you void God's covenant in your life. And I'm, I'm going to preach something, and this is, this is something that God began on me about even when we watch TV or listen to certain things on the radio or, or watch certain things on the internet, we got to make sure that we're not putting too much of the world inside of us. And before y'all get mad at me, this is a pastor who loves to watch TV. I ain't one of them ones that don't watch TV. My wife will tell you, I binge watch TV. I love the watch. I got Netflix, who I've had before, all of them. And I don't know how I even pay for all this stuff. I don't even watch all of it. But you know what God says? You know, when you have too much of that in your life, you can void some contracts with me. So you have to say, Lord, I got to give you time. I got to make time for God because I make time for what I want. I make room for what I want. Whatever I want to get done, it gets done. You can say, no, I'm going to get it done. I'm going to get it done. No, baby, whatever you want to get done, it's going to get done. Whatever you desire to do, it will get done. And God says when you link up with too much stuff, it's going to make the covenant in your life void. You have to decide to make the right covenants with the right people if you want God's favor. One of the biggest things that we do, that we, do not, that we neglect to do, is make the right kind of connections. Because sometimes we're so eager to connect with anybody that we don't make the right connections. Why are covenant relationships so important? Because covenant relationships are influential. Somebody say influential. Somebody has to compromise for the relationship to work. Now, I don't say you all married and raise your hand, but married people will tell, you, we will tell you that if you want it your way all the time, how do you want things to work? You'll be by yourself. I ain't by myself yet. Give me time. Give me time. 
Because I, I had to compromise. I was telling somebody, I said, marriage is negotiation. That's what it is every day. We're negotiating. It's what I want and what you want. We gotta meet somewhere in the middle. And sometimes you gonna win. Sometimes I'm gonna win. But at the same time, I need you to understand that both of us are influencing each other. My wife and I have been married for, we'll be, it'll be 19 years in February. 19 years in February. Amen. God bless you. 19 years. We catching up with y'all today. Amen. Amen. Y'all got four of us. Amen. But, but, but 19 years, and no other thing about it is, I've learned something that she's influenced me over these years. There are some things in me that need to be changed. Because they is not perfect. They did not have everything together. And God gave me a help me that I had to see a different side of things. And so therefore, she's been influencing me in my life for the better. And guess what? I had to influence her. She'll tell me sometimes, Daniel, you got to have more emotional intelligence. Then you got to make sure you, you read the room right and, and reading people right to make sure you're not saying the wrong thing and, and saying crazy things to people. You can't be so blunt all the time. You cannot be so so gruff and so direct. Sometimes a soft touch is good. Y'all better hear me. Sometimes don't always just go, you know, just try to run things and move things. Sometimes you got to have some tact in what you say and what you do. So when y'all see me get better, y'all better face the first, the first lady. Y'all better hear me? Because she's influenced me. But then sometimes I got to influence her. I said, baby, you need to understand something. You don't have to apologize to be treated right. You got to apologize for somebody to treat you right. No, no. Respect is only the minimal. Y'all better get me. Uh, no, no, no. I, I saw that respect. You got to respect me. You don't have to like me. But respect is the minimal. I'm not going to allow you to disrespect me. And I had to make sure I told my wife that because she's sweet and she's nice. I said, no, no, no. It's nothing wrong with you speaking up for yourself. It ain't ungodly for you to tell somebody, no, you're not going to treat me this way. So it's influence, is it? And the good thing about when you connect to the right person, they're going to grow you in a certain way and they're going to challenge you. But you connect to the wrong person, they're going to influence you the wrong way. Can I speak this in Jesus' name? I, 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 I wouldn't do that for my husband. I, 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 he, he can do his own thing. He, he can his own play. He can cook his own food. But that, that's, that's you. No, 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 I, I wouldn't do that for my wife. I wouldn't trust my wife like that. That's you. And sometimes we have the wrong people in our ears. And for young people, let me tell you this as well. There are people who are not just unmarried, not just young people, not married people, just the people who are, are, are single. Make sure even your friends have got to be the right connection. There are four kind of people in this world. Y'all know where I'm going. Those that add, those that subtract, those that multiply, those that divide. Everybody's gonna fit in one category. Now you may not like it because it's your cousin, y'all better hear me. And y'all been friends since y'all little kids, and it's your friends since the third grade, but everybody fits in one of those categories. Somebody shout connections. And after a while, what they say and what they do can influence you. It can mess you up. Look, look at this, look at this. Amos three and three. It says, can two walk together except they be agreed? Uh -huh. Me and Elder cannot drive to law unless we both agree to go to law. Right. If one of us don't want to go, something going to happen between here and law. Yeah. Somebody going to win, but somebody going to get hurt in the process. Yeah. The way that two walk together, they got to agree to go somewhere. If you're linked up with someone, you could be linked up with their destiny. When I was a, when I was a child, I remember when I first got a chance, you know, you know, church kids, we could barely go anywhere. When we finally had to go somewhere, you know, your mom gave that whole story, you know, and I make sure they got something in this car, you better call me. Don't hang out with that certain person. If they gonna do something crazy, don't you go with them? Because maybe you're not the person that's involved in that lifestyle. Right. But because you with them, y'all ready to hear me? Both of y'all going downtown. And we know that for young people, but even us as older people, y'all gotta understand this people who now might be 40 so as older people gotta understand even for us, when we link up with the wrong people and God tells you you should not be with that person, do not connect with that person, we want to ignore God, do our own thing, y'all better hear me inside of you. And when we do that, then God says, wherever they're going, that's where you're going. I'm gonna move along. 
But I'm going to tell y'all this. This is why I don't accept every obligation to preach. Right. After a while. I just don't. I, I don't connect with every pastor that's, that's cool. I will speak to anybody. I'll be cordial. I'll be nice. I don't believe in being stuck up. I'm, I'm going to speak. I'm going to be nice to you. But when it comes down to you saying we need to be brothers, we need to look up in this area that, that way, now i got to begin to look at you because the Bible says know them that may be among you. I'm going to know a bit about you before we just go to that situation because you may be on a path of destruction and because I'm with you. Don't link up with people that are not going where you want to go. It could cost you your relationship with God. And then the Bible says you got to break down their altars. God does not want us to trust in what they trust in, their systems. It was God's will for them to bring down their altars so that they would not, would not serve God's that could not help them in their time of need. We are not, we're not supposed to trust in what the world trusts in. Money. Y'all better hear me. Uh, people. All those things, governments. Yeah. We're not going to trust in those things. We trust in God. That's right. That's right. Can I make it plain to you? Psalms 20 and 7 says, Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. We don't trust what they trust because what they trust will let them down. You can have stocks and bonds and all these investments, and in one day the stock market could crash. And whenever you trusted in for so long, can be gone. But guess what? I'm going to still invest, but I'm not trusting in my stocks. I'm not trusting in my investments. I trust in God. We have to make sure that we break down the altars in our life. Whatever we trust in more than God has to be broken down because they will let you down in a time of need. If you trust in people more than God, you don't have to disconnect from them. You got to go put in your mind and say, Lord, I want to trust in you over this person. This person may disappoint me because we're all human. Because we're all human, we will disappoint people sometimes. But I'm not just trusting in that person. The Bible says put no trust in man. I put trust in God. I put trust in God. And so therefore when I say that I believe in what you're going to do, I'm saying I believe in the God that's inside of you. I know that you can't make it happen. I know that you can disappoint me, but I believe in the God that's inside of you. We're going to break down altars sometimes. But the Bible says, but you have not obeyed my voice, and obedience is the key to covenant. Obedience is the key to covenant. If you're not obedient to God, you void the contract. Bank told me, don't you pay your note, keep your car. I don't pay my note. I didn't be disobedient, they will take my car. It void the contract, doesn't it? Your obedience is greater than what you give. Uh, I think I want the preachers, maybe God put it this way, but even for offering, because your obedience is greater than what you give. Saul disobeyed God and gave God all these offerings. All these offerings. He was disobedient, though. And gave God all these offerings. But when he, and he said, you know, maybe God is going to look past my obedience, disobedience. And I gave him so much. But in 1 Samuel 15, 22, it says, and Samuel said, he's talking to Saul. He said, has the Lord, uh, 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 has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Look at what he's going to say. Look what he's going to say. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination or witchcraft and presumption as the iniquity and adultery. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Y'all need to stop saying that Saul was not anointed by God. Y'all need to stop saying that, that God didn't call Saul. He called David because they were his own heart. He called Saul too. Saul was anointed too. The only thing that messed Saul up was his disobedience. It was his rebellion. And God says, when you are rebellious to me, what happens is you reject my word. If you reject my word, you rejected me. And if you reject me, I'm going to reject you. So whenever we don't trust in the right things, whenever God says, I don't want you to go there, and we go there anyway. Whenever God says, cut off this connection, and we don't do it. What we've done now, we rejected God's word. If you reject God's word, you reject the God. Because in the beginning was the... And the word was with God, and the word was God. God is his word. You can't give your way out of disobedience. 
You cannot sacrifice your way out of disobedience. You have to obey God to make sure the covenant is enacted in your life. And before I go to my last point, I want y'all to hear this. Because sometimes people will come back to me and say, well, pastor, uh, you know, it's not working. And this is not working in my life. And it's not working in my life. And the first thing I'm going to ask you is, have you been obedient? <laughs> Where is the disobedience in your life? Because the Bible says my word will not come back to me void. God said his word will not come back to hit him void. So therefore, there has to be some place in your life where you, you were disobedient. The Bible says that when it went to Ai, the children of Israel, he told them, do not take one thing for yourself. Do not begin to take one thing from the enemy for yourself. I want you to burn all of it. Get rid of all of it. And the Bible says the next battle they went to, they lost this battle. And Joshua came back to God. And he stared God in the face and he said, you told me I'd never lose a battle. You told me that I've always been victorious. But we went out and fought and we lost this battle. And God said, don't come to me. There's something in your camp. There's some disobedience in your camp. And he looked inside the camp and Achan had taken something from the enemy and put it inside of his tent. And God, before he was trying to tell him, he said, I'm never going to break my word. You better check yourself. God better hear me. Can I tell you inside of here? You better check yourself. Before you say, Lord, when you didn't do what you're supposed to do, and Lord, you promised this, and it didn't happen, God says, where is the disobedience inside of your life? Because we can come inside the house of the Lord, and we can shout, and we can look good, we can dress up the outside really good, but sometimes we have secret rebellion, we have secret disobedience in our life, and God says, that's why I'm not moving, that's why I'm not doing the thing I should be doing, because if you have avoided the country, because you were rebellious and disobedient. Saints of God. Am I preaching to some honest people inside of you? And sometimes, yes, I came in, I shouted, and I'm still an elder. I'm still a deacon. I'm still a minister. I'm still a saint, a friend, all those things. But at the same time, sometimes God told me to do some things I did not do. And when I did not do it, God says, I am no longer obligated to bless you how I said I would bless you. It's that simple. My last point, my last point is consequence is no coincidence. Come on, man. Oh, I mean, Lauren Hill's album from 1998. Diamond selling, almost a diamond selling album. It's one thing she said, and she said, consequence is no coincidence. That means consequences don't just happen. They're a result of an action. I ain't gonna just talk about my son. My son came one time and his tower was flat, and I said, what happened, huh? I don't know what happened, Pop. Just happened. Son, no consequences, no coincidence. Something happened. There's a story behind this that you're not telling me right now. See, God doesn't break his covenant, but our actions restrict his move and his favor. Our actions. They said, so now I say, I will not drive them out before you. What would have been easy for us, it turns into a battle because we were disobedient. I'm going to give you a word. I'm going to give you a word that I want you to hear. A lot of things that we think are such a battle in our life, God said, I never meant for it to be a battle. Amen. Come on, Lord, I got to go up the rough side of the mountain. I never told you to do that. Amen. What happened was is that because you didn't do your side of it, I did not hold up my side of the bargain because you bought the contract by you not doing what you said you were going to do. And he said, I would have drove them out before you. I want you to walk into the kingdom, walk into the land, and not have to even fight, but just go into houses that you cannot build. Y'all better hear me. Fields that you cannot even plant. I wanted you to go into the great of the land, but because you were disobedient, now I'm not going to run them out. So I'm going to leave them. And the first thing they're going to be is thorns. Somebody say thorns. But they should become thorns in your side. People that you choose to connect with will become an agitation to you sometimes. Can I tell you something about thorns that you don't really feel them at first? And we can kind of ignore stuff at first. But as long as they stay, they're going to dig in deeper. And deeper. My, my vice president gave me a word. You know, he used to give me advice, but you know, he just gave me a word. He said, sometimes in situations when you get agitated about things, it's not that they changed, you changed. You begin to grow to a point. Well, you can't even know it no more. You begin to grow to a point where I cannot ignore your actions anymore. I used to be able to just count them off and just brush them off, but now that thorn is getting to me deeper and deeper and deeper. 
they become temptation to you. And this, and they don't leave just because you shout. Y'all would have hit me. They don't leave because you speak in tongues. They leave because you make deliberate action. Look at how long the Israelites fought against the Philistines. If you read Judges, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, they fought the Philistines all through those times. The Philistines should have already been taken care of. But what they did not deal with in their past, it oppressed them in their future. How many thorns do you have because you were disobedient in your past? It is oppressing you now in your future. It's oppressing you now in your presence. God says, I need you to cut some things off. Y'all better hear me. I need you to cut some things off because whatever you ignore, you're not going to change. But after a while, that thorn is beginning to get sharper. It gets deeper and deeper. And says, Lord, I used to be able to brush those things off, they said. I used to be able to brush it off when it did something crazy. But now it agitates to me so much. And God said, it's not that they change, but you are getting bigger. You are getting stronger in me. You are growing in me. And what you could ignore back then, you cannot ignore right now. I want to speak to you in this house. God says stop ignoring it. Get rid of the thorns. Get it done now. Because God said it's not going to change. It is not going to change. And we try to self-medicate. Lord, I'm going to shout inside church. I'm going to praise God in church. I'm going to lift my hands in the house of the Lord. Let me speak in tongues real quick. Let me get high on the spirit real quick. But when you come down, the thorn is still there, baby. <laughs> when you come down, the thorn is still there. When you go back home, the thorn is still there. Because nothing changes until you change it. It may be quiet in the house, but I'm helping somebody. Nothing changes until you change it. You shout the victory. But you say, Lord, when I get home, I'm going to make some changes. When I get back to my phone, I'm going to make some changes. When you speak in tongues, you're edifying yourself. I'm building myself up because I got a task to do. I got a work to do. And I got to get rid of these thorns because they're agitating me too much. I cannot keep growing and ignoring the pain that's in my side. But God says, I need you to get rid of the thorns. Yeah. Snares. He said that their gods will be a snare to you. Yeah. You will be become, become trapped by what, the, by, by what traps the world. Yeah. Certain things should trap Christians. Because right. our minds are not blinded. Amen. I spoke last night about how the minds are blinded by the enemy. My mind is not blinded. I know what it is. Yeah. I can see what it is. The Bible says the fowler awaits in vain if he puts the snare in the sight of the bird. That means if you put the trap where the bird can see it. This is what my, my daddy, you know, I couldn't fish. But my dad would say, you know, son, the reason why nobody no fish is getting on your hook. You know what they're going to say? Your hook's showing. Your hook is showing. And when the hook is showing, the fish sees, that's a hook. That's not a worm. That's pretty good. That, that, that's, that, that, see, God says those things that trap you yeah. because I gave you sight. Yeah. You know what's behind that curtain. Y'all better give me. You know what's in that snare. And see, what traps the world shouldn't trap us. But sometimes it's saying we find ourselves falling to the same traps that the, that the world falls into. Amen. Yes, Lord. Find ourselves in the conversation we should not get into. Yeah. Into beefs that we should not be beefing with somebody. We ain't gangsters, we saints, y'all. We beefing with people. What's wrong with y'all? It's quiet in this house. No, 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 no. We, we forgive our enemies. We love our enemies. We move on because we serve a great God. Saints don't want to hear that one. Because when we talk about enemies, y'all not going to talk about people. But the Bible said we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Two claps. Lord, deliver me from my haters. My enemies don't see my table. He's not talking about people. He created that person. He, that's his creation anyway. That person gets saved tomorrow. He's talking about principalities of my demons. That's your enemy. That shouldn't be because God's will is not for us to, uh, to, to, it's not for his people to be ensnared by the same things as the world. And when God frees you, don't go back because being re-entangled is deadly. Second yeah. Peter 2 and 20 says, For if after they have accepted the defilements of the world uh, and, and escaped, 
the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. They are given, uh, they are again entangled in them and overcome. And the last state has become worse for them than the first. Yeah. You ever heard people say, when you get saved, make sure you don't go back out? Because it's hard to come back. You know why it's harder? I'm going to preach this thing on you now. You know why it's hard to come back after you said, Lord, I was entangled in this before, and you brought me out of it. Yes. And we go back to yes. it. Because of the second time, the first time, you didn't know. Uh, the first time, your eyes were blinded. Right. It's worse on the second time because you know better. Right. And now, you got to deal with the mental side of you that says, I knew better. Right. And I'm back in the same state. What's wrong with my mind? What's wrong with me? I keep going to the same thing over and over and over again. Now you ain't got to say amen. I say amen for you. So I got to, well, what's wrong with me? And now the mental side mess of the devil say, you're crazy. You're, you're, you're stupid. You, you're, you're, you're not worthy of God's love. Because the second time he says, no, you knew better than you didn't do it. Somebody say snares. That's why we have got to make sure we tear down altars. Just because you believe in this, don't mean I'm going to believe in this. Because you don't want to trust God, don't mean that I'm not going to trust God. I'm not going to be in the same snares as the world. We serve a God, though, that can deliver us from thorns and snares. The key to coming back into covenant is, and my son said this morning as well, repentance. Oh, he just gave me the hell youth this morning. As saints of God, we don't repent like we should. You know what? I say one more time. We don't repent like we should. We don't turn like we should. We get some self righteous sometimes. So much more holy than now. I don't know how long I can holler, but it's the word. And we don't say, you know what? I was wrong. And repent quickly. Can I give you something? A sign of a true saint. It, 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 it's not a mark because he repents so much. True saints repent quickly. It's a mark against you if it takes you a long time to say, Lord, I'm sorry. And a turn. A good man falls seven times. But he gets back up. He does not stay down there in the same thing. about returning to God and recommitting yourself to him. In 2 Corinthians 39, it says, for if you return to the Lord, somebody say return. return. Your brothers and your children will find compassion with their captives and return to this land. For the Lord your God is gracious and merciful and will not turn away his face from you if you return to him. What I love about God and what I thank God so much for what he is is the fact that if I go back to him, if I follow him in the right way, and guess what happens? He says, I don't care what you did. If you come back to me, I'll never turn my face away from you. It does not matter if you forgive me or not. It don't matter if you keep it in your mind or not. It does not matter if you hold it against me forever or not. God says, if you return to me, I will always return back to you. He says, I never left you in the first place. Forms. And snares. Thorns and snares. I think, Lord, all these things happen because of disobedience. He didn't tell them those guys will be a snare to you before they, he proved himself to them. He had already proved himself to them. So they knew better. Get this. He said the thorn. Now I'm going to preach this and I'm going to move on, but this is it. Do you know there's nothing ever happened in my life that it turned out bad that in the beginning God didn't say, watch out. Watch out. Don't do that. Don't do that. We, we, we say I got a feeling. No, no, that's the Holy Ghost. Something's told. <laughs> that's the Holy Ghost. He said, look, 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 I know it don't look bad right now, but have you ever had that unction inside of the conviction? So I don't even know why God said no, but God said no. And sometimes we ignore it and we get thorns. 
the thorns and snares can be removed through repentance. stand to your feet, i'll be quiet.